Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, go with me to Hosea chapter number 1. Hosea chapter number 1 tonight. Hosea chapter number 1. i got to find it myself up here. Hosea chapter number one. That's a, you know the good thing about studying these books of what we would consider minor prophets is we do get to use a part of the Bible that we don't use very often. Besides when we're reading through the Bible, and uh, Hosea chapter number one. Last Wednesday night we dealt with who Hosea married. He married a woman of whoredoms, right? And then we dealt with. Uh, how Hosea's, Hosea and his wife is likened unto us as Christians today and to the church age that we live in. You know, that God loves us unconditionally even when we walk away from him. And that was Hosea here was this way. Even though that his wife was unfaithful at times, he still loved her. Then we got into the names um, of the children. And when we got into the names of the children, we dealt first of all with Jezreel. I'm trying to pull up my notes as well. We dealt with Jezreel and we dealt with how his name uh, simply meant to scatter or to uh, show blood or... um, Let me get back to my notes and I'll tell you exactly. Uh, Sorry about that. Jezreel uh, was his name. And when we got there, we realized that his name was that they would, uh, that his house would be punished by blood. Jehu commanded God to strike down and kill all Ahab's house. He did it with the wrong motives, he did it with the wrong intentions, and God dealt with him. About that, then we dealt with Jezre- uh, with uh, the second child, and there and her name was. Uh, n- let me get back here. I got it. My notes are a little bit over. Um, we dealt with J- Jezreel, and then we dealt with the third, ch- the second child. Um, let me see. The second child. Uh, was a daughter named Lo Ramaha, and which meant unpitied or not loved. Now, how would you like to have that name? A name that meant God was going to scatter, God was going to, God was going to destroy you by blood, and then you'd have a child by the name of not loved. Now, everybody loves their child. One thing that I've learned as a pastor, everybody's baby is beautiful, right? (laughs) A baby will come out nasty, bloody, cross-eyed, disgusting looking, and when you see it for the first time, oh, look how cute he is. He looks just like his mama. Well, (laughs) ain't that what we say? Or he looks just like his daddy. That's the biggest lie some of us has ever told. But when we look at that, when we look at that, we see here that that her name meant not loved. And God loved his people, but he proved it. And he proved it in many ways. Now he would withdraw that love and no longer show them mercy. We know that God's love is unconditional. And our enjoyment of that love is conditional, and it depends on our faith and our obedience. And last week I dealt with even though God loves us, hey, I got some volume, thank God. Even though God loves us and God cares for us, that we are still, we still can run out of the mercy of God if we walk in complete disobedience toward him. And I think that's where we left off last week. Now tonight I want us to get down in verse number 8 and verse number 9 tonight. And um, she had a second child. She had a third child. Verse number 9, the Bible says, Then God called his name Lonia. And you know what that name simply meant? For ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. This is the second time in the Word of God that we find that God has given a name 
of where he has withdrawn himself from the people. The first time was the name of Ichabod. My glory has departed. In other words, God withdrew himself. Here in Hosea chapter number 1, God said, Hosea, I want you to name your child, and I want you to say they're not of my people. Not only would God remove his mercy from his people, but he would also remove himself. He, he had renounced his covenant that he had made with them. When we think about that tonight, it would be... If, as I put it here in my notes tonight, it would be as a man or woman going through a divorce and turning their back on them or like a father rejecting or a mother rejecting their own child. And how sad that is. Go with me tonight to the book of Exodus chapter number 4 tonight. Exodus chapter number 4. Everybody good so far? All right. Exodus chapter number 4. Exodus chapter number 4. When you find your place in Exodus chapter number 4, say amen. amen. All right. Verse number 22. And it said, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Now that would be a sad thing for that to happen. But when we see this, the Lord went along and it came to pass, by the way, in the end, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. When we see this here, we see that a father, by not letting the people of God go, is turning his back. On his firstborn son. Tonight when we look here at, at uh, Hosea looking at the child here. Looking at his child. God is turning his back on them and saying you are not my people. Now why did God do that? It was because the people had first turned their back on God. God gave them chance after chance after chance and warning after warning. To make things right with him. So that is the names of the children. And then we will look at tonight in verse number 10 is where I want to pick up. Everybody with me? Everybody good on that so far? Any questions on the names? Are we all good? All right. All good, I take it. Verse number 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured, nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people. There it shall be unto them, said unto them, Ye are not the sons, or ye are the sons of the living God. When we look at this, I want us to look in verse number 10 that God changes the names of Hosea's children. The first names that Hosea's children was given was names that were warnings to the people, okay? God has a way at times of, how's the right way to put it? Changing his mind, right? Hezekiah, Hezekiah was told that he was going to die, right? Hezekiah began to pray and ask God, God change your mind. And God gave him 15 more years, Right? There were many times throughout the word of God that God was going to kill the children of Israel off and Moses would pray and ask God to save them. Then there was time that Moses said, God, why don't you kill them all? And God said, no. And I've often thought about this. What if God and Moses was ever get on the same page on the same day? What would have happened? It would have been bad news, wouldn't it? I could hear that conversation. So when we look at this tonight, God would change the names. We see the... We see the judgment of God, but now we see the grace of God. As we look at this, in verse number 10, Ye are not my people, was told to them previously, but he also said here, There it shall be said unto them, Ye are what? The sons of the living God. When we think about that tonight, God changed the names from not my people to ye are now my sons. Why is that? Because the heart of man changed, right? 
God seen their, they had been for God, they had asked God for their forgiveness. Then shall the children of Judah be the children of Israel, and the children of Israel be gathered together, and appoint themselves one head. And they shall come out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Instead of Jezreel being the place of slaughter, instead of Jezreel being the place of blood, we see now that Jezreel will be a place of uniting. We see that Jezreel will be a place of growth and a place of change, right? So when we look at this tonight, we can also find that in the book of Zechariah. Go with me tonight to Zechariah chapter number 10 tonight. Zechariah chapter number 10. Let me get there myself. Give me just a second. It's after the book of Haggai, before the book of Malachi. If you go, if you go to the beginning of the New Testament, go back a couple pages and you'll begin, you'll be in the book of Malachi. And then if you flip back a page or two, you'll be in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter number 10 tonight. Zechariah chapter number 10 and verse number 10. Nine. When you find your place there, say amen. All right. And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children, and what? Turn again. God here promised a uniting instead of destruction. When we think about this, we know that the Promises will be fulfilled to the Jews when they recognize their Messiah at his return. They will trust him and experience his cleansing. Then they will enter into the kingdom and the promises of the prophets will be fulfilled. The three children teach us about the judgment of God. These three children now also teach us about the grace of God. And I'm grateful for that tonight, aren't you? Now go with me to chapter number 2. I do not have chapter number 2 on a slide, so I ask that you follow along in your Bibles to Hosea chapter number 2 tonight. Hosea chapter number 2. Everybody good? For good, say amen. All right, we see the children of God being gracious. But why Gomer? When we look at Gomer tonight, uh, that's a funny name, is it not? Could you imagine, what's your wife's name, Gomer? What would happen if her husband's name was Homer? Homer and Gomer. <laughs> I think too deep in some of this sometimes. Huh? That's right. <laughs> Hosea here is preeminently the prophet of love. You know the prophets have different meanings. Jeremiah was known as what type of prophet? Weeping prophet, right? Here, Hosea is known as the prophet of love. The book of Song of Solomon is known as what? The love book of the Bible, right? So when we look at this tonight, but unlike some teachers today, he doesn't minimize the holiness of God. We are told that we love God if we what? Keep his commandments. Tonight, we've got a group of people, they'll teach on the love of God, and that's good. We should. But we don't need to pen knife it and only talk about the God of love. But we also should talk about the God of judgment. The God that'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. That is the whole, that's part of the holiness of God. That's a part of the justness of God. We are not only reminded that God is love, but we're also reminded that God is light, and in, in Him there is no darkness. We now realize that God's love is a holy love, not a sentimental feeling that condones sins. Oh, well, notice this, in pamper sinners. There's a group of people out there today, let me hold my spot right here. There's a group of people out there today that, that they have TV commercials saying, He gets us. And they show, uh, they show G this man who's supposed to be Jesus washing the feet of sinners. That's not biblically correct. The only people that Jesus washed the feet of were those that were his disciples. Right? 
Jesus sat down and ate with the sinners, but he didn't condone what the sinners did. He loved them, but he didn't get down there and say, let me wash your feet. When you see the washing of feet in the Word of God, it shows a kinmanship of a brother in Christ. Before you entered into someone's home, out of an act of humility and out of an act of kindness and an act of brotherhood, they would wash your feet when you came in. All right? Now, the Baptist church especially the primitive Baptist and other Baptist churches, practice foot washing. And it's usually on Sunday when they do communion. Now, I will tell you that it is the most disgusting thing that you'll ever do. I've done it. I've been there. But it's one of the most humbling acts of kindness that you'll ever do. Because when you... Or washing the feet of someone, you're humbling yourself to say, I'm no better than you are. And we had a rule that if you was good enough to get your feet washed, then you had to be good enough to wash someone else's feet in the process. And the way that we did it, and I don't know why I'm talking about this, but the way that we did it, we, the women washed the women's feet and the men washed the men's feet. But what I seen it do inside of the church when it took place... If y'all ever want to do it some Sunday, let me know. We'll do it. All right? You in, Jim? Huh? <laughs> so when you, when you do it, what I seen it do was bring a uniting of the church together. All divisions, all men's, all, not men's, all divisions, everything that had created a division of the church at this point had settled out. Not everybody would participate, but many would. So when you think about that tonight, we realize that God didn't condone the sin of the sinners, and he doesn't pamper the sinners. Never has, never will. When we look at this tonight, Hosea deals with three particular sins here in Hosea chapter number 2. So when we look here, the Bible says in verse number 1, everybody good? All right, verse 1. Say ye unto your brethren, Amy, and to your sisters, Ruma, plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, and neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breast, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that hath conceived them hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Hosea chapter number two doesn't sound like it starts off very good at all, does it? Unfortunately, when we look at this, we can look at God and Hosea as one person here, okay? Hosea is talking about his physical wife. God is talking about his spiritual wife. Make sense tonight? This is going, I got to be careful how I do this because I don't want to put Hosea on the same level as God, but I hope you follow what I'm saying. God is speaking to the children of Israel to tell them to rebuke their mother for her unfaithfulness. Just as Hosea is telling his children to rebuke their mother for her unfaithfulness. Does that make sense tonight? Could you imagine your child coming to you and saying, Mama, me and Daddy was talking today, and Daddy said that you're no longer his wife. That'd be some harsh words, wouldn't it? And daddy said 
that he's no longer your husband. And daddy said that you need to put away your whoredoms and your adulteries. You need to put all that away, mama, or you're going to lose everything. That'd be a hard conversation for a child to have for, to their mother. This is the conversation that God is telling the children of Israel, for those that are listening, warn the others about what the nation of Israel is getting ready to do. All right? Now, and I don't have time to chase this rabbit, but if you go back and study your Bible, you'll find out that God divorced Israel because Israel was playing the harlot. Right? That's how, that's how the church became the bride of Christ. Think about it. Y'all follow me on that? Are we lost? Am I good? All right. So God here is why is that? Because Israel was guilty of worshiping the gods of pagan nations that was around them, especially the Canaanite rain god Baal. As much as God had done for the nation of Israel, why would they want to serve another god? You ever thought about God gave them? Manna, God gave them bird to eat, God gave them every light in the night, gave them shade in the day, and here they are going to chase after a rain god, Baal. Now, there's something unique about that. When the prophets of Baal were, Elijah was on the mountain with the prophets of Baal, God rained fire from heaven, did he not? To consume the water. Notice that God used what they was trying to worship, what they said their God was, a rain God, God used heaven and rain fire down to consume those sacrifices that was put on the altar. You ever thought about that? Something to think about, is it? Move it on. Whenever there was a drought or a famine in the land, the Jews repeatedly turned to Baal for help. Instead of turning to the Lord. You can find that in 1 Kings chapter number 18 and chapter number 19. You can read that when you get home. Pagan worship involved in sensual fertility. Rites. And these rites, both male and female prostitutes were provided. In a literal as well as symbolic sense of idolatry. Which meant prostitution. Since these people were acting like prostitutes, God would treat them like prostitutes and shame them publicly. You know what's so bad? God today could say that about the church age that we're living in, that we are prostituting the church house. We're walking against truth. We're walking against known light. We're walking against the word of God, against the things of God. And God could shame us and unfortunately he is shaming us this past week over one million united methodists left the methodist denomination do you know why they said gay marriage is okay we're going to let gay pastors in there's five different denominations that said that that was all right all five denominations are prostituting what they say is the gospel to please this world. And God will shame them publicly. Right? So when we move this on tonight. It's not a pretty picture. Of what Hosea is, is doing here. In verse number 3. Lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born. And make her as a wilderness. And set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. God said he will not play this game with the children of Israel. Hosea said, I will not play this game with my wife. According to the Hebrew law, adultery was a capital crime punishable by death. God announced that he would dis discipline Israel. Notice this, but he wouldn't destroy her. Why wouldn't God destroy Israel? Because they were his nation. He had a plan for the nation of Israel all along. They were his elected people. That's where his son would come out of. He wouldn't destroy what he plans to use. Can I say this tonight? That even though that Israel was an adulterous nation, God still, God still used them. 
Tonight, people may not always live right. People may not always do right, but because they're not living right or doing right, when they repent, God can and still will use them. Y'all with me on that? Unfaithfulness to the Lord is a serious sin, just as unfaithfulness to one's mate is a serious sin. The man who says he's 90% faithful to his wife isn't faithful at all. Tonight, if I was to ask us how faithful are we to God, and I don't want you to answer this out loud, but I want you to answer this in yourself. Say, if I was as faithful to my spouse as I am as faithful to God, how long would I be married for? Israel was tempted to forsake God for idols. The church is tempted to turn to the world system that hates God and wants nothing to do with God. So first of all, tonight we see that God deals with our idolatry. Secondly, tonight, this may be as far as we get, God deals with their ingratitude. Gomer loved her idols. Gomer was ungrateful. A person tonight that is in sin and was walking in sin will not be a grateful person. You show me, it, you show me an ungrateful person and I will show you a person who is miserable on the inside. A person who is ungrateful is not content. The Bible tells us in whatsoever state that we are in that we should be what? Content. Now, a preacher friend of mine, his wife passed away, and he called me over, he called me over to his, um, we was at his house one day. He said, come here, i got something I want to show you. You'll get a kick out of this. And he took me over to the verse of Scripture. It said, whatever state I am in, I am therefore to be content. And his wife had rode out North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina. They were all the states he pastored that she learned to be content in. And she thought that's what that scripture meant. And uh, we laughed about that. But tonight when we look at Hosea's wife, Gomer, she was ungrateful. How do you know that she is ungrateful? Verse, the last part of verse number, or first part of verse number six, or last part of verse five. She said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Notice this. Hosea's wife wasn't after anything from her lovers except for material gain. Hosea's wife was selling her body for material gain. She sold her body for bread, water, wool, flax, oil, and drink. Think about that. Things that are, what's the word, minute to us today. Things that, well, we can get water about anywhere we want to go, right? It may not be clean, but we can get it. We can get bread about anywhere we go, right? Things that are minute she was willing to sell her body for. Unfortunately, today, the church age that we're living in, we're willing to sell out the gospel for more people. We're willing to sell out the gospel so that we can please others. The gospel's not for sale, right? The gospel is the gospel. Jesus died on a cross for every man. Either they will accept it or reject it. Moving on, verse 6. Behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall, and she shall not find her paths. God here is beginning to say what I'm going to do. Instead of thanking me for my food, water, clothing, the nations thank false gods. And they use those gifts from God to give to their idols. Think about that. How, how would you feel tonight if you came to me and said, Listen, I need, I need $20. To go to McDonald's tonight after church to get me something to eat. So I gave you $20, okay? And I ran the street corner down here, and you got some person in the corner getting drugs from them with the $20 that I gave you. How would you feel about it? You'd be mad, right? I would be angry. 
But you, I would step back and say that's between them and God. God will deal with it. The nation of Israel was taking what God had given them and taking it before an idol and saying, Thank you, little idol, for this bread, for this water, for this oil, for this wool. That God had blessed them with. When we think about the ingratitude, God had every right to abandon his people, but instead he chose to discipline them. The nations would chase after false God, but God would block their paths and confuse their plans so that they would stumble on their way. He would take back his gifts and leave the nation as naked as a newborn baby, as barren as a desert. He said, and she shall follow her love after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not what? Find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. And a lot of times when that happens, it's way too late. Moving on. After he stripped her down, she said, I'm going to return to them. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for who? Baal. God said, this is how dumb these people are. I bless them, I give it to them, and they give it to a false god. You know who got rich in that, in that situation? The prophets of Baal. Right? When we look at that tonight, that's sad. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and I will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. When we see this, God is stripping them down nothing a lot of times in order for people to find their way back to God God has to take them down a path which they do not plan to go as we look at this it's remarkable how many times in the scriptures that we are commanded to be thankful do you know how many times in the word of God we're commanded to be thankful anybody want to give me a number Fifteen different times in the Word of God. Psalms 100 and verse 4 and Colossians 3, 15 both admonish us to be thankful. Both Jesus and Paul set the example by giving thanks and often to the Lord for His blessings. When we think about that and when Jesus break bread for His disciples, the Bible says that He break it and blessed it. Right? And then when he went to give the wine, which was the fruit of the vine, he, after the same manner, therefore, you know what he did? He blessed it. Tonight, when we think about this, one of the first steps of rebellion toward God is the refusal of giving thanks to God for his mercies. Say, so prove it. I will. Go with me to the book of Romans and we're done. Romans chapter number 1 tonight. It, Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. When you find your place in Romans 1, say amen. Verse number 21. Because that when they knew God, they what? Glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was what? Darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. What did God do in verse number 24? God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. When we get on through to verse number 28, 
Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God here giving them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And finally he said, you don't want anything to do with me. I don't want anything to do with you. God will not allow us to enjoy his gifts at the same time we ignore the giver. For this is the essence of idolatry. Tonight we must be careful that we don't become like Gomer. And there's still a couple more sins that we're going to deal with. We, got, we must be careful that we don't become like Gomer, but we be more like Hosea. Does that make sense to everybody tonight? We don't need to be idol worshiping. The Bible says, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Right? We don't need to be ungrateful because the Bible tells us in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Is that what Paul wrote? If Jesus gave thanks over the bread and over the wine, why shouldn't we give thanks for what he's done for us? And then, tonight, we must realize that the first step toward walking out of the will of God is being ungrateful. The prodigal son, and I'm going to say this and I'm done. The prodigal son didn't go to his father and say, Father, I want to thank you for what you're going to leave me in my inheritance. But the prodigal son acted as the woke generation today and was entitled to his inheritance. I want, I need, and I need it now. That's not the way that God operates. Tonight, we're not entitled to the grace of God. We're not entitled to the love of God. We're not entitled to nothing, but we have it tonight because God, out of his mercy, chose to bless us with it. And we must be forever grateful. All right, I'm done there. Any questions, comments, concerns?